والحمد لله رب العالمين وكفى وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما وفحما وعبدا كاملا ربنا يسر ولا تؤسر اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم everybody <coughs> so today we will uh, go on to prayer times and recommendations this will be probably one of the sections where we have to spend a little bit of time because of confusion and in my personal opinion uh, based on measures uh, I'm one of those people who are reasonably pedantic about this because I think we, uh, because there are so many errors that in fact exist around in different parts of the communities uh, that uh, there has to be uh, a, a revisitation of prayer times in every community. I would recommend that you would go to your community and at least your families to actually create a group which would uh, start a kind of a, uh, uh, the idea of tawqid, the idea of actually keeping time. Uh, firstly, moon sighting, and secondly, in terms of getting your prayer times uh, revisited, because a lot of prayer times are based on normal, uh, sorry, common standards, which may not apply to you particular location, because you are actually far from the standard uh, that actually has been calculated from. I'll give an example of that. Uh, I'll use two examples so that uh, uh, hopefully that actually helps. Uh, I'll, I'll use country, cities so that it actually helps uh, in that regard. So. Um, I'll just use one example. Maybe United States is probably the most common place where most people know a little bit about. So if you go to, say, for example, San Francisco, you have uh, the, uh, the older location of Zaytuna used to be in a place called Hayward. And the distance of travel between the two from San Francisco downtown to Hayward is probably about one hour, Sidi Fahim? About 40, 45 minutes. That's about the time you'd be, you'd be for the travel. Now, the, the benchmark time for that Bay Area is actually based on the island of Alcatraz, which is in San Francisco Bay. Once you travel to Hayward for approximately 45 minutes to an hour, the time difference could be as, as, as little as around about 45 seconds. But you start to move towards San Jose, you're probably talking about maybe a minute. But the standard time that you'll be given is as if it was at, at, at Alcatraz, right? So for Australians, for in Sydney, our time basis is actually coming from Gosford. And if you're living in Bankstown, which is the most hip city of the world, <laughs> uh, 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 the time difference between the two is actually two and a half minutes. So when the Avan goes on the basis of a standard time, you're two and a half minutes earlier in breaking your fast. Right? So you have to be careful of following time basis in that regard. And therefore, I would strongly recommend that, in fact, you go back and actually do mushahada or observation of your particular location and get it right and understand what the time difference is. And it could be as small as one minute or so, in some cases two and a half minutes, in some cases four minutes. I know, for example, in some parts of Sydney, uh, that is the case, or, or New South Wales in that regard, because you follow that kind of a standardized time. And you have to be aware of that. So let's look at the time frames of, uh, of our prayer time. Firstly, Fajr begins at true dawn in, uh, at a time when there is horizontal white light across the horizon as opposed to vertical light which may appear prior to true dawn, which is called, called the false dawn. So the Prophet ﷺ has explained this to us. And I strongly recommend, as a Muslim, if you have never experienced false dawn and true dawn, or at least the true dawn, in your lifetime, experience the sunnah. Go out there and, and ve your eyes are to sight these signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the clock. And in this is a mysterious gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go and experience this, right? So find a place where you can actually go in and, and check this out. But you'd have to be, you know, quite far away from city light pollution. And generally speaking, for large cities like New York, you'd actually have to travel about two hours away from New York proper into, into dark uh, uh, regions to, to actually get away from um, city light pollution. But do experience that. Uh, it doesn't matter how much people will explain to you about what true dawn looks like. It's not until you see it that you really know what you're talking about, right? So do go and experience it. So Fajr begins at true dawn 
and ends just before sunrise. Just before sunrise here means, I'll use uh, for all the discussions we'll have, I'll use this as my horizon, and my hand as a circle as a disk of the sun, all right? So the meaning of that is that when the top disk of the sun has not, is just about to be, be actually become visible, that's the point of time when, uh, when Fajr becomes uh, uh, no longer valid, and, and that becomes what is called sunrise, and it's prohibited for you to actually pray any prayer when sunrise actually is happening. So who can tell me how much time does it take for the sun to come from the top disk to the lower disk? 15 minutes? 8 minutes? Half an hour? 3 minutes? 2 minutes and around about 40 seconds, 50 seconds. 3 minutes. Uh, and for your information, sunrise in the what is called civil sunrise, which is different from the Shari'i sunrise, is when half the disk is above the horizon. So your CNN sunrise time is based on civil sunrise. So if it says sunrise at 6 a.m., it really is one and a half minutes before that when sunrise actually has just come. In other words, 6 a.m. is there, which means 558 approximately, or 558 and 30 seconds, is when our sunrise actually has been effected. Not the sunrise of CNN. Our sunrise is different from CNN's sunrise. Not CNN, you know what I mean. Right? So be aware of that. That the civil, the, the, the publications of uh, sunrise in, in, in civil papers and journals and newspapers, t television, is based on this half disk uh, above the uh, horizon itself. So be aware of that. Uh, for your information, Maghrib is similar, and I'll speak about it when we come to Maghrib as well. And this is one of the, one of the things about Maghrib is uh, the problem of Ramadan. And I can tell you how many different communities I know where I've actually seen sun still above the horizon, or at least half the disk above the horizon, and people are breaking their fast. It has just invalidated your entire fast of the day, right? So these things are not simple. These things are not about, you know, breaking fast together uh, with, with the same mulkhiyah and all that kind of stuff. It's about your ibadah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhuhr sets... Uh, in other words, Dhuhr just comes in uh, just after midday. Uh, and midday here does not mean 12 p.m., right? Midday here means when the sun actually has come to the mid part of the sky, the highest portion of the sky before it starts to descend. And ends when the shadow of an object is twice its own length. Uh, so uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll explain to that part there uh, of an object twice its own length. And second part, or equals its own length, I'll talk about it secondly, separately. Firstly. Dhuhr does not st doesn't start when the sun is at its highest point. Dhuhr starts when the sun has started to decline such that you can calculate that the length of the shadow has started to increase again. So what will happen, and again, in theory these things can become complica complicated. If you exp and I again ask you to go home and put a stick on the ground and measure it. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu uh, qu quoted in a few books, the one I remember right now is from Tabarani, where he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says that the best of my ummah are those who measure their prayer times with a the, with the stick in the ground and observe the sun, uh, observe the uh, crescent for the lunar months. These things are not uh, matters of convenience. These matters are means by which we are uh, experiencing in which we are looking to enter into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a formal manner. And you and I will never enter the, the doors of a king, the doors of the prime minister, in the doors that they have not asked us to enter from. So these matters are not matters of convenience and just a side little logistics. These are matters of true elements of our ibadah. And we have to understand it from that perspective. So when the... Uh, when the sun is rising up to midday, the, sun, uh, the sun's shadow will become shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it comes to the midday. And for a period of approximately 7 to 12 minutes, uh, 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 and I'm speaking about uh, countries which are within 30 degrees of the north and south of um, the, the latitude, uh, up to maybe 40 degrees, but above that things are different. And uh, I'm not talking about countries like extremes of Norway, for example. So if anybody here is from Norway, and you're experiencing, you know, white nights and 24-hour days, etc., uh, things will be different. I'm speaking about countries like Turkey, uh, down into the equator, 
and then into uh, you know countries like um, uh, then you actually come into the, the southern hemisphere Australia obviously without a doubt uh, in South Africa uh, etc so those are the countries I'm actually speaking about uh, it, the, 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 uh, around about 12 minutes uh, uh, is when the shadow length will not change the direction of the shadow will change but not the length and comes a point when the length will start to increase again that's the time when the horror comes in right so the from the 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 point of midday in other words the the, the, the Sun being right uh, at its highest point it is around about 7 to 12 minutes after approximately when the Dhuhr time actually comes in. As I've said, that 7 to 12 minutes is a rule of thumb for countries which are close to the equator, up to 30 degrees north and south of the latitude. Um, beyond that, things will be slightly different. In the Hanafi school, the dominant opinion is that the Dhuhr ends when the shadow of an object is twice its length, minusing the original length, the shadow of the, the time of Zawal, the time of uh, midday. Every object actually has a shadow at midday uh, between the Tropic of Cap Cancer and Tropic of, of Capricorn. Uh, uh, in this area over here, uh, twice a year you will have no shadows at, at midday because the shadow will be right below you. But all countries outside of the tropics uh, will always have a shadow uh, uh, all the time uh, there's no there's no time in, in fact you will like to not have actually have a shadow so that amount of shadow at midday must be excluded from the le the measure of the shadows itself and as I said inshallah the theory helps you to conceptualize what I'm explaining but it'll require some some practical activity and I'm very happy to miss a lunch or two to do those kind of things in practice uh, so if you are uh, uh, ready to do that I'm happy to uh, help out in doing that so when the twice the length actually comes in is when the whole times the whole time comes to an end as we will see the next point when the asaf time starts now according to abu yusuf uh, the the shafi'i time which is the one length uh, aspect of the of the shadow is also valid so in the hanafi school uh, that one length of the shafi'i time is valid with conditions um, before I continue about the discussion about that, I want to clarify some a, a very important hadith. And this particular hadith is an, a very amazing example of, of why Imam Abu Hanifa is considered to be Imam al adam The hadith tells us about why the, the twice the length, in other words, the later time of Asr, is actually the dominant opinion. And we should follow, the, uh, 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 I will make the point that the Hanafis, as a Hanafi, we should not pray our prayer of Asr at the time of the Shafi, unless the Shafi'is are leading the prayer. If a Shafi Imam is leading the prayer, it is permissible for us to join the prayer. But if you as a Hanafi uh, are going to lead the prayer or praying alone, it's the later time of the prayer, which is the second uh, uh, length, uh, the, the two length uh, uh, aspect. The Hadith, it's a long Hadith, uh, briefly, the hadith is about where the Prophet ﷺ says that the time of the Ummah, sorry, the time between Asr and Maghrib is like the time of the Ummah. And he gives an example of this as an analogy. He said that, the, uh, that a man said to the, to, to, to the, to the people of uh, Israel that, uh, that who will work for us for one, uh, for one qiraat, I think it's one of the currencies, between uh, uh, morning and, and midday. And, and the Yahud agreed to actually work for one Qirat in this period of time. Then another man in another time asked the Nasara, the Christians, who will work for the same amount of money between Dhuhr and Asr? And the Christians agreed to do so. And uh, another time uh, uh, was asked of, about the person who will pray between uh, work for the same amount of money between Asr and Maghrib. And it, it was the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu and the Jews and the Christians complained that we actually, and this is the critical part of, this is where madhab shines. Because information is implicit, and if you don't know the language, if you don't know the context, if you don't know the, the context as to what is, being, uh, what is being said, you will not be able to derive these rulings. And I can assure you there are so many rulings which require... Uh, objective analysis and you'd come to a couple of different alternative uh, conclusions and that's where that's the reason why the madhahib actually differ because all of those uh, conclusions in fact uh, 
uh, uh, are, are correct. So when they complain that we work longer, why would we be given less amount of money uh, and, 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 the, and the Ummah of the Prophet is getting twice the reward for a shorter amount of work? Right? And, and the hadith continues that the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have I wronged you for what you have done? And, and the people said, no, we have not wronged you. Actually, that's a fair amount. And, and, the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then whoever I give additional blessings to is, is for them. It's for, for, my, for me to do what I will. Right? And, and that's the end of the hadith itself. The point that comes out of this is immediately Imam Abu Hanifa realizes that the time between Dhuhr and Asr is longer than the time between Asr and Maghrib. And that's the dominant opinion that in fact the time should be the later time, the twice the length time. Right? And the other scholar, and, and there's a hadith for this for his evidence. There are other hadiths which the Shafi'i school holds upon and, and, and consider the earlier time to be the, the optimum time in that regard as well. Uh, so inshallah that actually helps understand the, the difference of time between the uh, Asab time for, for the Hanafi and the, and the Shafi'i. I also want to make a point that in the Hanafi school, to delay your dhuhr after the, the so-called Shafi'i time of Asr till the Hanafi time of Asr, in other words, that, that later part, is actually makruh. Right? It's makruh. So should we should not be delaying our prayer to that part of the, of the time of, uh, of the day, although the prayer will obviously will be valid. Yes. So does this go to mean that if one is a traveler and they want to not combine because you obviously can't shift a time of salat from one block to another. You cannot pray dhuhr as far back as possible so that you only have a short period of time that you have to wait for asr. Okay. No, it's not because it's not about you must. It's makru for a resident. For the traveler to delay the prayer so they can actually pray the dhuhr and wait for the time for asr to came, come for them, which is the Hanafi asr, for them to then pray the asr is fully permissible. This rule is purely under, for the resident. Under we, normal circumstances. Yeah, under normal circumstances. Any exceptions will be explained as we go along. These are, as we go along with fiqh, all normal circumstances will always be explained until we actually come to the exception, exception. But that's a very good uh, note to actually keep there for you to actually realize that, in fact, that is the case. Alhamdulillah. So, to then repeat... Oh, sorry, yes, go on, yes, yeah. Um, I had a question in regards to Asr. If it's the dominant opinion, then why do the other three madhahib have that the earlier time? As I said, they have other evidences. So you can't say one evidence is stronger than the other. They're both as strong. They're both as right. Okay. They're both right, yes, yeah. yeah. They're both right. Go on, Sidi. Just for example, from where I come, the most of the people there are Shafi. So uh, can I pray as uh, the whole, for example, at such a time that Almost the Asr time is going to come in, the Shafi Asr time. And then I go into the mosque, which is the Shafi mosque, and I pray the Jama'ah with them. But yeah, is, that, is, that, is there any conflict in that? No, there's no conflict at all, because you're praying in a Jama'ah where the Shafi is leading. What if the Asr Adhan has been given of the Shafi, and you pray the Dhuhr, and then you join the... Uh, it's like as if you join two prayers. I mean, this, this, is what is, well, this is what we call about entering into the gray area, and you have to avoid those kind of circumstances. You know, you have to keep your prayer prior to the Asr of the Shafi, and then join them in the in the jama for for masjid to pray the to pray the asr and that'll be fine. But to 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 go into the masjid to pray your dhuhr while the uh, the adhan of asr actually has just been given and then you pray asr is not something which is uh, that can be considered to be uh, prohibited. But it's certainly entering into gray areas of doubt, and we should not be acting on doubt here. You know, so in other words, the aspect of prayer is not just making the pedagogical physical movement. You need to actually intend to know that you're actually praying at the right prayer time, right? And so praying at the same time like that uh, 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 is, is, is uh, I would use the word dubious at, at the least. Yes, good. Uh, did you say that it was makroh to pray in the, for instance, the end of the Lord? In between the time with the Shafi and the Hanifi, is that what you said was yes, makroh right. to pray makruh the Lord? Yes, to pray the Lord at the time, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Tanzihan. Alhamdulillah. So, just to repeat, therefore, the Asr point, because the Dhuhr and Asr really has to be looked together, so we'll repeat the Asr point here, that Asr begins when the shadow of an object is doubled. I'm hoping you understand why I'm missing the first part there. 
uh, uh, is doubled, begins to increase until sunset. That is the Hanafi position. I'm going to give you some very, some of these kind of situations where, where there could be a difference of opinion. Uh, we need to actually stick to, because it's a foundational fit class, I'm going to give you the practical Hanafi position. Once we become experts on, on fit matters and conditions may apply, then you can apply things slightly differently. But right now, this is a foundational class and uh, uh, the doubled, uh, the later Hanafi time of Asr is the opinion that we must follow. Number seven, Maghrib begin, begins, begins, let's say, rain. Uh, Maghrib begins when the sun has set completely and it ends when the red twilight disappears. And here's another point that needs to be uh, clarified. Um, so can you uh, write there uh, at the point when it says Maghrib begins when the sun has completely uh, has set completely and it ends when the red slash white twilight disappears. There's a difference of opinion in the Hanafi school between the two, and I'll explain. So again, Maghrib and Isha will be sort of combined in the explanation. Firstly, Maghrib begins when the sun has set completely. That is, that the disk, the upper disk of the sun has disappeared from the horizon, right? Uh, uh, observantly, that in fact actually has gone beyond between, uh, below the uh, horizon. Uh, that will constitute sunset, not, not prior to that. Again, uh, by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the time the adhan is, by the time people make wudu, adhan, and pray maghrib, they will inshallah be in the maghrib time. But it is at the Ramadan time when this becomes problematic because everybody's sitting down with a date in their hand 10 minutes before uh, sunset, and it's like Allah Akbar in the, in the radio, and boom, you know, straight into the mouth. You have to be careful of this. And for those who are coming from Sydney, I know you, you have heard me go on about this uh, often a number of times, but I would be. Um, uh, I don't think I would be uh, uh, remiss at all, uh, amiss at all to actually suggest that if you go back to your own countries, into your own cities to actually check this out, that the, the uh, and if you can just look at the sun, Ramadan is coming, just watch the sunset and, and know what the times are given and see if the sun actually has set. Right? In some cases, it, it might not be the case because of this half-disc civil sunset problem. Right? So check that out. It, 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 this is not about and sorry to sort of, you know, say it in a kind of a humorous way, although it might not be the most humorous thing. Uh, you know, starting fast and breaking fast is not about some kind of a familial gathering for food. It's about first and foremost ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether you eat mulkhiya or biryani together or not, it doesn't make a difference to your, to, your, to your fasting. You're breaking your fast, you're invalidating your fast if you eat actually prior. So you need to be sure. It's fard al-ayn for you to know. Now, generally speaking, uh, you, you can follow the times provided. And, and that actually is fard al kifaya for a community to actually, um, you know, have a record of time. But I can, uh, th you know yourself, I'm pretty sure, that this actually is a problem. Uh, and in, in fact, it's a general problem, which means that we have to return to mushahada, we have to return to observation and get our times right. It is not acceptable for us to say, well, you know, the calendar is printed and that's acceptable when we know there are actual errors in there. And Shaykh Hamza Yusuf, Hafidullah himself had mentioned that in fact for Dhuhr and Maghrib there are actually problems, say, in, in calendars. And therefore you need to actually go back and actually check this out. I'm not telling you to cause, cause fitna in your community, okay? Don't go into the masjid and, and whinge and complain. You know, do it with, with hikma and with, with compassion and love and courtesy and wisdom with each other so that you're able to help the community to get things rectified, right, inshallah. And, and, and whatever errors we make un inadvertently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us for that, you know. Uh, so our reliance on this matter is the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the fact that we would do the right thing because we now know we can actually get it right. There's a sister right at the back first, please. She actually has a question. Yep, sis. You had a question, right? No, 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 just, yeah. just there, yeah. Um, so in countries like this, in this country, um, like where they, in here in Turkey, in here in Turkey yes. when, when they, um, they, they read the Quran, the, the Adhan at specific times and, and you hear it pretty much universally throughout the country, is that problem still prevalent here? You know, is it, is it? Cause we're not directly depending on like an online time, a list of times. I mean, I'm not, do you think that is, is there the same idea of like when you go to someone's house and you accept that their food is halal, is there an idea that you accept that the adhan is at the right time when it's universally? Yeah. Generally speaking, when everything is good, everything is good, then in other words, we know it actually is at the right time, then it's acceptable. 
I know, for example, I can speak for Australia, times are not accurate. I can tell you by, by measure. So, I, so and, and this question is well known in the community, and therefore people actually have to make the observations to get it right, at least for their own small city communities, inshallah. But for it, Turkey, I, I really don't know. Uh, my understanding would be that the Hanafis are quite particular about this, and I would probably think that, in fact, when, when I've been watching uh, 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 the, the Sunset Times over here, and when the Adhan actually has been coming here, according to my observation for the last week and a half approximately, it's pretty good, mashallah. Right, so Allahu you'll, Alam, you'll have to, you'll have to, you know, uh, talk to people here and, and, and see uh, uh, if there are actually considerations for potential error there. If you live in a place though where it's not readily av available to see the horizon, or you, uh, you live in a mountainous region, or you can't verify it directly by sight, and if you move somewhere else, you've lost that sort of lo location. Sure. How do you verify it? Yeah, this is one of the things we as a Muslim community are losing out, and I think probably lost. Uh, we would actually depend on proper calculation on this, right? So it would not be acceptable for a community to say, well, you know, there's a mountain in front of me, and I don't really know what's going on. Actually, the, our fic makes it very clear what we should do, right? So we can actually calculate it to the real horizon as if the mountain was not there, and that will be our sunset uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and we can calculate that uh, very easily with uh, plenty of software available for this, as long as you make sure that actually it's not giving you civil sunset, actually it's giving you astronomical sun sunset, for example. So just to know those bits and pieces and people of knowledge will know that, and they can actually calculate that out, inshallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So that's the first part. That's the sunset part. Uh, it ends when the red or the white twilight disappears. Imam Abu Hanifa held it's when the white twilight finishes, uh, which is a later time. And Abu Yusuf and uh, Sahabain, Abu Yusuf and uh, uh, Muhammad Shaiban held it that in fact it was when the red uh, twilight finishes. And for your information, the Shafi'i school holds also for it to be when the red uh, Shafak, Shafak al Ahmar finishes, which is slightly earlier. Maliki and the Shafi'i school hold that to be the view. The Hanafi school in, the, in Imam Abu Hanifa's point is in fact it's the white twilight. Let me explain a little bit of things, and, I'll, and then I'll tell you what you should what you should follow, inshallah, or what I recommend for you to follow as my personal opinion in this regard. Imam Abu Hanifa considered the white twilight, which would be approximately 17.5 to 18 degrees of depression of the sun, and that would be approximately one and a half hours after sunset in normal circumstances of the latitudes between 35, 40 degrees of north and south latitude, uh, about one and a half hours after sunset approximately. Again, you'd have to actually observe to know when the white twilight actually completes in your particular location. These things are not standardized like computer, boom, and that's it. It requires some real uh, uh, measurements uh, and knowing the local uh, um, actual uh, uh, you know, geopositional location, the so-called GPS, uh, for you to actually get that answer right. Um, the Shafi'i school uh, and the Sahabain, the, the two companions of Imam Abu Hanifa, Shaibani and Abu Yusuf, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, uh, held that it was a red twilight, uh, which is Shafiq al-Ahmar, and that is approximately one hour and 15 minutes from sunset. So there's a 15 minute difference of opinion, right? between the two. Now, that being the opinions, let's talk about some signs behind it. We now know, and this is where I think our shiuch have to spend time to review matters in a manner to provide tajdeed or re revival of a certain understanding of the ijtihad of certain of these kind of things because the matter is of ijtihad. Scientifically, we now know that the redness of the sky, the Shafak al-Ahmar, is actually subjective. The Shafak al-Ahmar is dependent on atmosphere, temperature, whether you are in a location of cities or in a location of non-city areas, light pollution, etc., etc., etc. In other words, we would say, in the Hanafi school, Imam Abu Hanifa's position of the white twilight, which is the universal astronomical celestial in event, is actually the, uh, the ac more, more accurate one. And therefore, the white twilight, despite the fact 
that in the Hanafi school there's a, there's a very strong fatwa that the red twilight would suffice. In my well-researched uh, uh, opinion, and I apologize to say it that way, uh, I have gone and studied this matter in very much detail, that the white twilight is actually what defines the Hanafi position, in my opinion, the Isha time. Because it is the celestial benchmark. The redness isn't. The redness is actually subjective to, to, to what actually is happening. Pollution affects it. Air density affects it. Which where the wind blows affects it. And to the extent where now the, the end of the red, redness in the sky can actually differ by approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So the redness of the sky can actually continue to one and a half hours when the whiteness of the sky has completely gone. In other words, you can actually see out there that it's actually dark night now, but there's still patches of red. All right? We know this. We actually have been able to, you know, scientists have been able to go and measure this. Interestingly, in the Hanafi school, and alhamdulillah for the Hanafi school, um, there is an, there's a very, very beautiful explanation about this difference of opinion. And it actually matches exactly what actually is happening in reality on, on land. The opinion in the Hanafi school in terms of commentary to this difference of opinion is that the whiteness of the sky is for the city. And the redness of the sky is for the non-city areas, deserts, very rural areas, etc. Why? Because the redness and the whiteness actually don't differ much at all. Because of pollution and air densities, etc., in deserts and uh, in, uh, very rural areas, it's very stable. But in city areas, it actually fluctuates hugely. So my opinion would be that city areas should actually follow through with the whiteness of the sky, the end of the whiteness of the sky. And if you were in a desert area where there are no built environments, etc., that the redness of the sky would suffice as, 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 as an opinion. My opinion is the redness of the sky in the Hanafi school for the city, metropolitan areas, suburbs, etc., will actually not suffice. In other words, it does not fulfill the suburb of what the Hanafi school's objective is in the first place. All right? So hopefully that sort of long and somewhat technical explanation helps to actually understand uh, what these circumstances are. This is a question that's over here. Says. So uh, just to repeat that, Although there is a fatwa existent about the redness, that, that, that Maghrib ends at the redness of the sky, the dominant uh, uh, understanding of Imam Abu Hanifa still holds true, and therefore my recommendation would be the whiteness of the sky uh, that actually completes the end of the whiteness of the sky that actually completes the time of Maghrib, and obviously the beginning of Isha, which will be the next point that we'll be we're speaking about, and that's approximately one hour and 30 minutes from the time of sunset approximately rule of thumb doesn't apply all the time sorry sis go on yes the red twilight is before the white that's right does this then give us longer time to pray maghrib does it give you a longer period of time to pray for maghrib? the white twilight yeah yeah if uh, we without a doubt white... yeah, about 15 minutes extra approximately uh, if things were stable as i've said uh, uh, red twilight in some cases can actually be all the way to one and a half hours I have actually experienced uh, in, in, in New York uh, approximately one hour and 40 minutes uh, of actual red, red twilight. Um, what is the time period between Maghrib and Aisha that you have to pray? So what time do you have to finish praying Maghrib before you can pray Aisha? Basically at this point of time. So at, you can... at, the, at, the end, at the end of white twilight is the end of Maghrib. So, so if, you have pray, if you have done your tahrim, your takbir al-taharimi before the white twilight has uh, come in uh, sorry before the white twilight is finished yeah. you, you are praying your maghrib uh, validly within the time although makru to have left it so, so long so, so does late. this then mean we can do the same with Duhur and Asr pray if we're a traveller you can delay maghrib as much as possible and, and then, then pray your Isha. Pray yeah, you, you, it's permissible to do so. But in my personal opinion, uh, uh, we should, uh, even as a traveler, we should actually hold our prayer to the earlier time. We'll be looking at the recommendations in a minute. We would only do that when there are conditions existent for you because of delay, because of inconvenience, because of circumstances, instead of making that as a rule. The rule is actually to actually pray your prayer times 
at the at the afdal time, at, at the more uh, optimized time. To delay it would, would require conditions to actually exist for it to be truly uh, uh, hasan, to, for it to be beautiful with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, yes go on, Sayyidi. In the UK, they, in the summer, we have a problem whereby the light actually never disappears from the sky because uh, the days are very long, so the days basically extend into the night. In other words, night sets, but the light continues to stay in the, in the, in the sky. Yeah, it's actually so. It affects the, Shia, Shia, the, the Isha prayer. Yes, so technically the Isha prayer doesn't actually come in uh, based on what we've just discussed. So the, the white light never disappears. Yes. What they do then is they take the time for sunset and they add one and a half hour and then they say that's when Isha occurs. However, there are some mosques which after saying salam for Maghrib, they immediately do, do iqama for Isha and they say and then pray Isha. Would that be acceptable to do that? Uh, I, I would recommend that all British Muslims would move to Australia. It's easier. <laughs> Ahlan wa sahlan. <laughs> Uh, look, I, I, I have not experienced uh, the, the, the white nights uh, uh, in, in its details, and I have not actually studied it uh, beyond the theory of it all. But this matter is experiential. You have to actually go and observe this uh, rather than simply theoretically. So I can purely give you some theoretical examples of the explanations of this. The, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what is the most correct thing to do is something you actually have to speak to people uh, of knowledge locally. And people like uh, Mufti Kofari, for example, will be a, a very relevant person to actually get the get his fatwa on this matter. I think he actually has a fatwa on the matter, and actually and then act upon that matter as an example. Hafidullah, one of the most uh, brilliant in uh, you know, a Hanafi fuqaha of our time, mashallah. May Allah preserve him and raise his ranks. Um, firstly, it is incorrect of the conception or, or the kind of a, a general. Uh, assumption uh, of uh, people in Britain that in fact technically Isha does not come in. Actually there's a 2000, 2004 Greenwich uh, observatory paper in which they talk about Islamic prayer times. In interestingly non-Muslims are giving us indications of these kind of things so we should be doing our scientific uh, research of this matter well, well, uh, 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 you know, before and properly than what is being in informed of us. I personally have studied this matter at the theoretical level by looking at models and without a doubt in Britain you can actually see the gradation of the of the sky as defined by the Prophet that has not happened by the Muslim community the Muslim community is looking at kind of an assumed let off set of what I would call deficient ijtihad and coming to conclusions I would be recommending to the British community to actually do a proper mushahada with scientific calculation and you will see that in fact the redness of the sky can be defined. Right? The 2004 paper by Greenwich Observatory, my understanding is that um, uh, SubhanAllah, Bernard, Bernard Yallop is the one who actually who, who, who did the uh, supervision of the paper. And it's, an, uh, it's a very, very interesting paper to actually give some in, uh, indications of that. So I think there's, there's a lot more questions to be answered before we can say this or that methodology is in fact somehow uh, 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 more appropriate. So hopefully that gives some further uh, uh, food for thought rather than a complete answer to the question. Alhamdulillah. Yes, go on, Sini. Um, Sheikh, at what point does Maghrib actually become makru? Um, we... we, we to delay the prayer to its last part is makru all the time, right? But in Maghrib, you can't, you can't say that. In fact, for Maghrib to be hastened to its earliest time is, is, a, is an emphasized sunnah. So, to lead from that, therefore, the time of Isha and Wittal prayer, which follows the Isha prayer, commences when the white twilight, in my opinion, has disappeared and ends a little before true dawn. In other words, before true dawn sets, your time for uh, Isha has completed. It is wajib to follow the order of Isha before performing Witr. You have to pray your Isha, then Witr. As a side note, say for example, you pray your Isha, then your Witr, and you then realize for some reason your Isha prayer was invalid. 
In this situation, your Witr prayer is valid. You simply have to repeat your Isha prayer. You don't have to repeat your Witr prayer. Number nine, the Hanafi school does not allow one to join two prayers in the one time unless the, uh, unless the allowed instance is during Hajj, which is Arafah and Muzdalifah. So to, to add to the point that one of the brothers actually was mentioning about going to a masjid, you pray your Dhuhr and then you pray your Asr, it, it, it is actually a problematic situation to actually do in that, in that regard. But what this point is saying, if you're a traveler, as a Hanafi, there is no joining of prayers. There is no joining of prayers. You shorten your prayers, which we'll be speaking about, but there is no joining of prayers in the Hanafi school at all. It's prohibited. Number 10. It is recommended for men to pray Fajr at the glow of dawn when the sky brightens. In other words, for men to go to the masjid in the Hanafi school, there's a recommendation that, in fact, the sky has not only formed the true dawn white light on the base of the horizon, but, in fact, there is light entering into the, into the environment, so you're able to walk to, to the masjid itself. And I wanted to clarify some, one of the sisters actually brought as a question, is for women, if you're praying at home, it's better for you to hasten to Fajr earlier, which, in other words, it's still what I, what I would call atmospherically dark. Right, the, the, the horizon has been formed, but atmospherically it's dark. But if you're going to the masjid, it's best to actually delay it slightly so there's in fact light in the in the atmosphere and you can actually then pray your maghrib. Yes, God says. What uh, does, sorry, your fajr. Sorry. What does one do if um, you know you are going to miss a prayer? For example, if you work during an entire prayer time or some sort of obligation that makes you miss a prayer and if we can't join it early so can you give me because there, uh, 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 your first comment tells me that in fact that was not an obligation your second comment says it's an obligation so give me a particular example so i can actually give you an answer ex example uh, answer because if there was an obligation in, in its true sense because obligation is defined not uh, not because we feel obligated right. if there is an obligation for example a midwife who is actually uh, delivering a, a baby and there's an actual reason for her to be at the, at the birth because if she's not there the baby might die or the mother might have complications then she can delay her prayer outside of the prayer and she simply prays it as a qada prayer but work is not an, is, is, is not excusable yeah work is not excusable because uh, you have to find the time now if there are circumstances where you have situation where you know the boss is saying there is no way you can pray here the first answer to that is you got to find a new job the second answer is that if you don't find a new job, do your best, you, the best you can, right? So is that helping helping the answer or do you want to add to that, sis? No, no that helps. That's good, yeah. So the point I also want to emphasize here is that we have to define what the obligation is, right? Yes, go on, sis. What about when traveling, um, if you know you're going to miss either the or Asa, well, you're going to miss, um, can you take the Shafi dispensation? By well, joining no, the prayers? Th no, there is no dispensation per se. You have to pray the prayers qada, and 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 and, and, and pray for for forgiveness of the matter in that regard. Uh, but again, to uh, you, you can pray sitting down, you, you, right? So you can take all of those uh, options available. For example, you couldn't actually get make, to make wudu. You make tayammum, right? All those options will actually have to be taken into account. You see? Yes, go on. See. Yeah, go on. Whoever has the microphone, go on to. Uh, my question is regarding to prayer times. If you're traveling to a non-Muslim country where those aren't available and you're too busy to, you know, actually see when the prayer times are, how would one go about, you know, finding them? Would it be okay to look them up online or take the... Yeah, the online prayer times are, are reasonably accurate. It, 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 uh, what, I, what I mean by getting your prayer times right is that the, the online prayer times work on a standard location. So standard, standard times work on a particular location in a city where they actually use that as the, as the longitude and latitude by which they work the prayer times for every, every other place. And time differences can be two to three minutes and four minutes approximately. It is your obligation to in fact work the time out. You cannot be too busy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to. So if you go to a non-Muslim country where there is no availability of time, use the online time. At time and maybe add another five minutes to it or something like that, 
right? And, and, and that should suffice because you know at least you're in a certain time. Period.